Law 3. Conceal your intentions. Judgment. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you are up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. Part 1. Use decoyed objects of desire and red herrings to throw people off the scent. If at any point in the deception you practice, people have the slightest suspicion as to your intentions, all is lost. Do not give them the chance to sense what you are up to. Throw them off the scent by dragging red herrings across the path. Use false sincerity. Send ambiguous signals. Set up misleading objects of desire. Unable to distinguish the genuine from the false, they cannot pick out your real goal. Observance of the Law in 1850, the young Otto von Bismarck, then a 35-year-old deputy in the Prussian parliament, was at a turning point in his career. The issues of the day were the unification of the many states, including Prussia, into which Germany was then divided, and a war against Austria, the powerful neighbor to the south that hoped to keep the Germans weak and at odds, even threatening to intervene if they tried to unite. Prince William, next in line to be Prussia's king, was in favor of going to war, and the Parliament rallied to the cause, prepared to back any mobilization of troops. The only ones to oppose war were the present king, Frederick William IV, and his ministers who preferred to appease the powerful Austrians. Throughout his career, Bismarck had been a loyal, even passionate supporter of Prussian might and power. He dreamed of German unification, of going to war against Austria and humiliating the country that for so long had kept Germany divided. A former soldier, he saw warfare as a glorious business. This, after all, was the man who years later would say, the great questions of the time will be decided not by speeches and resolutions, but by iron and blood. Passionate patriot and lover of military glory, Bismarck nevertheless gave a speech in Parliament at the height of the war fever that astonished all who heard it. Woe unto the statesman, he said, who makes war without a reason that will still be valid when the war is over. After the war, you will all look differently at these questions. Will you then have the courage to turn to the peasant contemplating the ashes of his farm, to the man who has been crippled, to the father who has lost his children. Not only did Bismarck go on to talk of the madness of this war, but, strangest of all, he praised Austria and defended her actions. This went against everything he had stood for. The consequences were immediate. Bismarck was against the war. What could this possibly mean? Other deputies were confused and several of them changed their votes. Eventually, the king and his ministers won out, and war was averted. A few weeks after Bismarck's infamous speech, the king, grateful that he had spoken for peace, made him a cabinet minister. A few years later, he became the Prussian premier. In this role, he eventually led his country and the peace-loving king into a war against Austria, crushing the former empire and establishing a mighty German state, with Prussia at its head. Interpretation At the time of his speech, in 1850, Bismarck made several calculations. First, he sensed that the Prussian military, which had not kept pace with other European armies, was unready for war, that Austria, in fact, might very well win, a disastrous result for the future. Second, if the war were lost and Bismarck had supported it, his career would be gravely jeopardized. The king and his conservative ministers wanted peace. Bismarck wanted power. 
The answer was to throw people off the scent by supporting a cause he detested, saying things he would laugh at if said by another. A whole country was fooled. It was because of Bismarck's speech that the king made him a minister, a position from which he quickly rose to be prime minister, attaining the power to strengthen the Prussian military and accomplish what he had wanted all along, the humiliation of Austria and the unification of Germany under Prussia's leadership. Through insincerity and misleading signals, he deceived everyone, concealed his purpose, and attained everything he wanted. Such is the power of hiding your intentions. Keys to Power Most people are open books. They say what they feel, blurt out their opinions at every opportunity, and constantly reveal their plans and intentions. They do this for several reasons. First, it is easy and natural to always want to talk about one's feelings and plans for the future. It takes effort to control your tongue and monitor what you reveal. Second, many believe that by being honest and open, they are winning people's hearts and showing their good nature. They are greatly deluded. Honesty is actually a blunt instrument which bloodies more than it cuts. Your honesty is likely to offend people. It is much more prudent to tailor your words telling people what they want to hear rather than the coarse and ugly truth of what you feel or think. More important, by being unabashedly open, you make yourself so predictable and familiar that it is almost impossible to respect or fear you, and power will not accrue to a person who cannot inspire such emotions. If you yearn for power, quickly lay honesty aside and train yourself in the art of concealing your intentions. Master the art, and you will always have the upper hand. Basic to an ability to conceal one's intentions is a simple truth about human nature. Our first instinct is to always trust appearances. We cannot go around doubting the reality of what we see and hear constantly imagining that appearances concealed something else would exhaust and terrify us. This fact makes it relatively easy to conceal one's intentions. Simply dangle an object you seem to desire, a goal you seem to aim for, in front of people's eyes, and they will take the appearance for reality. Once their eyes focus on the decoy, they will fail to notice what you are really up to. You can use this tactic in the following manner. Hide your intentions not by closing up with the risk of appearing secretive and making people suspicious, but by talking endlessly about your desires and goals, just not your real ones. You will kill three birds with one stone. You appear friendly, open, and trusting. You conceal your intentions and you send your rivals on time-consuming goose chases. Another powerful tool in throwing people off the scent is false sincerity. People easily mistake sincerity for honesty. Remember, their first instinct is to trust appearances, and since they value honesty and want to believe in the honesty of those around them, they will rarely doubt you or see through your act. Seeming to believe what you say gives your words great weight. To make your false sincerity an effective weapon in concealing your intentions, espouse a belief in honesty and forthrightness as important social values. Do this as publicly as possible. Emphasize your position on this subject by occasionally divulging some heartfelt thought though only one that is actually meaningless or irrelevant, of course. Napoleon's minister, Talleyrand, was a master at taking people into his confidence by revealing some apparent secret. This feigned confidence, a decoy, would then elicit a real confidence on the other person's part. Remember, the best deceivers do everything they can to cloak their roguish qualities. They cultivate an air of honesty in one area to disguise their dishonesty in others. 
honesty is merely another decoy in their arsenal of weapons. Part 2. Use smoke screens to disguise your actions. Deception is always the best strategy, but the best deceptions require a screen of smoke to distract people's attention from your real purpose. The bland exterior, like the unreadable poker face, is often the perfect smoke screen, hiding your intentions behind the comfortable and familiar. If you lead the sucker down a familiar path, he won't catch on when you lead him into a trap. Observance of the Law In 1910, a Mr. Sam Giesel of Chicago sold his warehouse business for close to $1 million. He settled down to semi-retirement and the managing of his many properties, but deep inside he itched for the old days of deal-making. One day, a young man named Joseph Weil visited his office, wanting to buy an apartment he had up for sale. Giesel explained the terms. The price was $8,000, but he only required a down payment of $2,000. Wiles said he would sleep on it, but he came back the following day and offered to pay the full $8,000 in cash if Giesel could wait a couple of days until a deal Wiles was working on came through. Even in semi-retirement, a clever businessman like Giesel was curious as to how Weil would be able to come up with so much cash, roughly $150,000 today, so quickly. Weil seemed reluctant to say and quickly changed the subject, but Giesel was persistent. Finally, after assurances of confidentiality, Weil told Giesel the following story. Weil's uncle was the secretary to a coterie of multimillionaire financiers. These wealthy gentlemen had purchased a hunting lodge in Michigan ten years ago, at a cheap price. They had not used the lodge for a few years, so they had decided to sell it and had asked Weil's uncle to get whatever he could for it. For reasons, good reasons, of his own, the uncle had been nursing a grudge against the millionaires for years, this was his chance to get back at them. He would sell the property for $35,000 to a setup man, whom it was Wiles's job to find. The financiers were too wealthy to worry about this low price. The setup man would then turn around and sell the property again for its real price, around $155,000. The uncle, Wiles, and the third man would split the profits from this second sale. It was all legal, and for a good cause, the uncle's just retribution. Giesel had heard enough. He wanted to be the set-up buyer. Weil was reluctant to involve him, but Giesel would not back down. The idea of a large profit plus a little adventure had him champing at the bit. Weil explained that Giesel would have to put up the $35,000 in cash to bring the deal off. Giesel, a millionaire, said he could get the money with a snap of his fingers. Weil finally relented and agreed to arrange a meeting between the uncle, Giesel, and the financiers in the town of Galesburg, Illinois. On the train ride to Galesburg, Giesel met the uncle, an impressive man, with whom he avidly discussed business. Weil also brought along a companion, a somewhat paunchy man named George Gross. Weil explained to Giesel that he himself was a boxing trainer, that Gross was one of the promising prize fighters he trained, and that he had asked Gross to come along to make sure the fighter stayed in shape. For a promising fighter, Gross was unimpressive looking. He had gray hair and a beer belly, but Giesel was so excited about the deal that he didn't really think about the man's flabby appearance. Once in Galesburg, Weil and his uncle went to fetch the financiers, while Giesel waited in a hotel room with Gross, who promptly put on his boxing trunks. As Giesel half-watched, Gross began to shadow box. Distracted as he was, Giesel ignored how badly the boxer wheezed after a few minutes of exercise, although his style seemed real enough. An hour later, Weil and his uncle reappeared with the financiers, an impressive, intimidating group of men, all wearing fancy suits. The meeting went well, and the financiers agreed to sell the lodge to Giesel, 
who had already had the $35,000 wired to a local bank. This minor business now settled, the financiers sat back in their chairs and began to banter about high finance, throwing out the name J.P. Morgan as if they knew the man. Finally, one of them noticed the boxer in the corner of the room while explained what he was doing there. The financier countered that he too had a boxer in his entourage, whom he named. Wilde laughed brazenly and exclaimed that his man could easily knock out their man. Conversation escalated into argument. In the heat of passion, Wilde challenged the men to a bet. The financiers eagerly agreed and left to get their man ready for a fight the next day. As soon as they had left, the uncle yelled at Wilde right in front of Giesel. They did not have enough money to bet with, and once the financiers discovered this, the uncle would be fired. Weil apologized for getting him in this mess, but he had a plan. He knew the other boxer well, and with a little bribe, they could fix the fight. But where would the money come from for the bet? The uncle replied. Without it, they were as good as dead. Finally, Giesel had heard enough. Unwilling to jeopardize his deal with any ill will, he offered his own $35,000 cash for part of the bet. Even if he lost that, he would wire for more money and still make a profit on the sale of the lodge. The uncle and nephew thanked him. With their own $15,000 and Giesel's 35000 they would manage to have enough for the bet. That evening, as Giesel watched the two boxers rehearse the fix in the hotel room, his mind reeled at the killing he was going to make from both the boxing match and the sale of the lodge. The fight took place in a gym the next day. Weil handled the cash, which was placed for security in a locked box. Everything was proceeding as planned in the hotel room. The financiers were looking glum at how badly their fighter was doing, and Giesel was dreaming about the easy money he was about to make. Then, suddenly... A wild swing by the financier's fighter hit Gross hard on the face, knocking him down. When he hit the canvas, blood spurted from his mouth. He coughed, then lay still. One of the financiers, a former doctor, checked his pulse. He was dead. The millionaires panicked. Everyone had to get out before the police arrived. They could all be charged with murder. Terrified, Giesel hightailed it out of the gym and back to Chicago leaving behind his $35,000, which he was only too glad to forget, for it seemed a small price to pay to avoid being implicated in a crime. He never wanted to see Wilde or any of the others again. After Giesel scurried out, Gross stood up under his own steam. The blood that had spurted from his mouth came from a ball filled with chicken blood and hot water that he had hidden in his cheek. The whole affair had been masterminded by Weil, better known as the Yellow Kid, one of the most creative con artists in history. Weil split the $35,000 with the financiers and the boxers, all fellow con artists, a nice little profit for a few days' work. Interpretation The Yellow Kid had staked out Giesel as the perfect sucker long before he set up the con. He knew the boxing match scam would be the perfect ruse to separate Giesel from his money quickly and definitively. But he also knew that if he had begun by trying to interest Giesel in the boxing match, he would have failed miserably. He had to conceal his intentions and switch attention, create a smokescreen, in this case, the sale of the lodge. On the train ride and in the hotel room, Giesel's mind had been completely occupied with the pending deal the easy money, the chance to hobnob with wealthy men. He had failed to notice that Gross was out of shape and middle-aged at best. Such is the distracting power of a smokescreen. Engrossed in the business deal, Giesel's attention was easily diverted to the boxing match, but only at a point when it was already too late for him to notice the details that would have given Gross away. The match, after all, now depended on a bribe rather than on the boxer's physical condition. And Giesel was so distracted at the end by the illusion of the boxer's death that he completely forgot about his money. Learn from the yellow kid. 
The familiar, inconspicuous front is the perfect smokescreen. Approach your mark with an idea that seems ordinary enough. A business deal, financial intrigue. The sucker's mind is distracted, his suspicions allayed. That is when you gently guide him onto the second path, the slippery slope down which he slides helplessly into your trap. Keys to Power If you believe that the deceivers are colorful folk who mislead with elaborate lies and tall tales, you are greatly mistaken. The best deceivers utilize a bland and inconspicuous front that calls no attention to themselves. They know that extravagant words and gestures immediately raise suspicion. Instead, they envelop their mark in the familiar, the banal, the harmless. The simplest form of smokescreen is facial expression. Behind a bland, unreadable exterior, all sorts of mayhem can be planned without detection. This is a weapon that the most powerful men in history have learned to perfect. It was said that no one could read Franklin D. Roosevelt's face. Baron James Rothschild made a lifelong practice of disguising his real thoughts behind bland smiles and nondescript looks. Stendhal wrote of Talleyrand, Never was a face less of a barometer. As one poker manual explains it, while playing his hand, the good player is seldom an actor. Instead, he practices a bland behavior that minimizes readable patterns, frustrates and confuses opponents, permits greater concentration. An adaptable concept, the smokescreen can be practiced on a number of levels, all playing on the psychological principles of distraction and misdirection. One of the most effective smokescreens is the noble gesture. People want to believe apparently noble gestures are genuine, for the belief is pleasant. They rarely notice how deceptive these gestures can be. Another effective smokescreen is the pattern, the establishment of a series of actions that seduce the victim into believing you will continue in the same way. The pattern plays on the psychology of anticipation. Our behavior conforms to patterns, or so we like to think. In 1878, the American robber baron Jay Gould created a company that began to threaten the monopoly of the telegraph company, Western Union. The directors of Western Union decided to buy Gould's company up. They had to spend a hefty sum, but they figured they had managed to rid themselves of an irritating competitor. A few months later, though, Gould was at it again, complaining he had been treated unfairly he started up a second company to compete with Western Union and its new acquisition. The same thing happened again. Western Union bought him out to shut him up. Soon the pattern began for the third time. But now, Gould went for the juggler. He suddenly staged a bloody takeover struggle and managed to gain complete control of Western Union. He had established a pattern that had tricked the company's directors into thinking his goal was to be bought out at a handsome rate. Once they paid him off, they relaxed and failed to notice that he was actually playing for higher stakes. The pattern is powerful in that it deceives the other person into expecting the opposite of what you are really doing. Remember, it takes patience and humility to dull your brilliant colors to put on the mask of the inconspicuous. Do not despair at having to wear such a bland mask. It is often your unreadability that draws people to you and makes you appear a person of power. <laughs>